Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to day two of TESS. I happen to be in my office in downtown Toronto, uh, just within sounding distance of Old City Hall, and I heard the clock toll one, so I know that we are on time. Thank you very much for joining us, and I hope that you had a great day yesterday. We've got another great day lined up today. Yesterday, we had Beverly Roy from Kenjigewenteg provide a land affirmation for us. And today I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land we are on. I am a treaty land inhabitant. My parents immigrated to Saskatchewan from the United Kingdom in the 1960s. I was born in Saskatchewan and I grew up loving the prairie and its expansive sky, but I was ignorant of the fraught history of colonialism that enabled my parents to move and live there. I now live in East Toronto on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The ability of Indigenous people to harvest from and thrive on the land where we live has been grievously impaired by colonization. Indigenous people's freedom to use and enjoy these lands was further eroded by treaties. These treaties exacerbated injustices for Indigenous peoples, including poor compensation, inadequate reserve lands, and the inability to freely exercise harvesting rights. Acknowledging the wrongs of the past are important as it lets us take responsibility for the future. And this is part of my personal commitment to the Truth and Reconciliation Call Commission calls to action because we are all, each and every one of us, treaty people. You can find out what traditional territories you're on by going to nativeland.ca or native-land.ca. Uh, I think Lupia is gonna put that in the chat for us, thank you. Uh, please feel free to share where you're coming from in the chat. So day one was a lot of fun uh, in our new week of test format. I don't know if you could see this, but I made a badge today, hashtag week of tests. I'm quite proud of my craftiness. Uh, my favorite part of day one was the learner panel and the discussion around options and hybrid learning and to hear the learners actually talk about their experience with this. A question was asked by one, how hybrid is your hybrid? And this really resonated with me as we work as a sector to mature these forms of learning. The minister uh, yesterday in her opening remarks talked about virtual learning now being an essential service. And I think that's a really great way to encapsulate what, uh, what it means to teach and learn in today's environment. And I know you're going to have a great time uh, with uh, our keynote speaker today who is quite expert at this. Uh, in fact, just in the green room, I was uh, learning a few uh, tips and tricks from him. Now, finding ways to provide familiarity for all on what types of learning enables what kinds of outcomes is important as we start to structure digital by design learning for scale. So our research evaluation and foresight team have been busy producing innovative and informative reports on the virtual learning strategy and two come to mind. And I'm going to try and share these in the chat. Here's the first one, hopefully those will go. Um, and I'll get the second one in just one moment. So that first report, it has a great graphical representation of types of hybrid learning design. The report states, hybrid learning balances the best of in-person and virtual learning. And I thought that was really interesting because the learner panel, the learners were talking about, um, are, is there a standard for hybrids? Hybrid is different for different contexts and perhaps different learning uh, styles, or different learning environments and different subject matters even. And with the broad remit, with this broad remit of hybrid learning balancing the best of in-person and virtual learning, we have lots of scope to figure out what works best for a given situation. So the second report, which I'm going to put in the chat, uh, on tomorrow's learners shows how understanding learners is key to ensuring that our digital by design learning environments can meet the needs of all. Yesterday, I attended a great panel on uh, design thinking and what design thinking means uh, for designing. This was health sciences education from folks from McMaster University. And I think this is a very important concept about, uh, and we've heard this yesterday as well, leading with empathy and what it means to design a learning environment by truly understanding what the learners are bringing to the, uh, to the situation. So doing so, understanding all learners, it's very important and highly relevant to today's topic, which is community, belonging, inclusion, and anti-racism. Before we get to our keynote though, we're very, very pleased today to be joined by a special guest, Assistant Deputy Minister Tamara Gilbert. 
Tamara is currently the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Advanced Education Learner Supports Division at the Ministry of Colleges and University. Tamara's division includes the Digital Learning Policy Branch, led by Anna Boyden, which has been responsible for developing the virtual learning strategy and implementing the VLS in close cooperation and partnership with eCampus Ontario. Prior to joining MCU, Tamara has held a number of leadership positions across the Ontario Public Service, including roles at Cabinet Office, the Ministry of the Attorney General, and the Ministry of Health. Tamara herself is a lifelong learner with three post-secondary degrees and is currently the proud member of two book clubs and three honorary hockey teams through her husband, son, and daughter, respectively. Uh, truly, Tamara, there must be some micro-credentials for uh, the hockey teams in there somewhere. Now, I have the good fortune of working closely with Tamara and Anna and their colleagues in the digital learning policy branch. We worked very closely, as, as I just said, on uh, the design and distribution of the virtual learning strategy. We continue now through what we call VLS 2.0. And throughout this time, I've found Tamara to be a thoughtful colleague, an inquisitive problem solver, and a strong supporter of her team. She's also just a nice person. So I'm quite pleased to introduce her to you today, who is speaking on behalf of Deputy Minister Shelley Tapp. Tamara, over to you. Robert, thank you so much uh, for that introduction, the kind words, and more importantly, the incredible leadership that you've shown at eCampus and the collaboration and uh, constant thoughtful engagement uh, leadership that your team uh, has demonstrated to the and committed to the virtual learning strategy and to the work that you do with the ministry. So thank you so much for that. And everyone, I believe you knew that we were all expecting uh, Deputy Shelley Tapp. Uh, to be here to provide opening remarks from the ministry, but unfortunately the deputy does send her regrets. She's a bit under the weather, um, but as you can probably tell, I am truly thrilled to be here on her behalf and step in with our remarks from the ministry. So I wanna start by saying, uh, as I mentioned, as Dep and as Minister Dunlop uh, mentioned yesterday, that we at the ministry are really so fortunate uh, to have eCampus's partnership and leadership in bringing to life the Ontario government's virtual learning strategy. But I just want to mention that point yet again, because the partnership is such an excellent example of the value of co-creating together. So fully in line uh, with the theme of this year's very uh, relevant test conference. Um, I also want to flag the partnership, the ministry, and I know so many of you also have with another organization and leader in virtual education in Ontario, and that's Contact North. Uh, Contact North is such a valuable resource to students and institutions, particularly as we know in those small, uh, remote, uh, underserved communities across the province. And I'm pleased to sort of spend a moment to note the announcement that the government made just a few weeks ago uh, around the services provided by Contact North, and that specifically there'll soon be an enhancement to those services and the addition of a laptop and internet loaner program, which will be available through Contact North uh, Learning Centers. So I invite you to stay tuned for more information on that, which will be coming from Contact North. And this is really all part of our shared, the government, uh, eCampus, Contact North, and all of you, our shared effort to remove barriers, uh, enhance access, and help Ontarians get the skills they need without having to leave their communities. So, on this year's conference, incredible conference, uh, when I learned that this year's theme is co-creating the future and that the focus is on how we shape and inform virtual learning offerings together uh, with insights from many points of view, um, I knew that we could look forward to a really inspirational and unique event. Uh, I caught a number of the speakers and presentations yesterday and they were excellent. So thank you so much, uh, eCampus, for your work in bringing together such an incredible agenda uh, and including us uh, in the conference. And I'm eager, as I'm sure you are, to listen to the leaders and the change makers who will be guest speakers in the days of the conference uh, that follow. And I know that from the point of view of the ministry, it is those very insights uh, and knowledge which both the panelists, uh, but also the participants bring to this conference which are fundamental to supporting a post-secondary, not just supporting, but building a post-secondary education sector that provides that anytime, 
anywhere learning, that essential service, as Robert said, as the minister said yesterday, uh, that is uh, our learning system in French and English without compromising quality. So we know that learners have different reasons for needing and wanting virtual learning, whether it's to accommodate childcare, elder care uh, needs at home, uh, whether they want to stay home in a small community during learning, whether they want to rapidly upskill, train for a second career, the, the reasons and the rationale go on and on and are very learner specific. Uh, but no matter what the learner's needs and reasons are for virtual learning, uh, we know that the need is real. And this, co this conference is just such a great forum for providing that collective focus on how to develop more choice in quality virtual learning opportunities and really moving that needle on reducing barriers and maximizing access to education. So as has already been mentioned a few times, the government's virtual learning strategy, there's just been a ton of progress on that already. Uh, many of you, of course, not only aware, but participated and participating uh, in the uh, first round of funding, the, the, the expressions of interest, uh, which was run through uh, eCampus Ontario earlier this year to develop those virtual learning projects that are really meant to support and drive the government's virtual learning strategy. So through that process, the government is now supporting over 300, oh, nearly, pardon me, getting excited, nearly, that's still a huge number, uh, nearly 400 uh, innovative projects that colleges, universities, Indigenous institutes, some of which will be showcased this week. Uh, and each project is amazing um, and illustrates the innovative work that you're leading and that is being led uh, by the sector. But I'm gonna flag a few. Uh, I'll tell you that selecting a few to flag or call out was a very tricky business. So even before calling out a few projects, I do want to call out the, that um, the VLS showcase is conveniently part of the test welcome page. I've been there often myself already and includes a description of all the projects. So as Robert and I think some other speakers have already invited you to do, I invite you to peruse uh, that showcase and check out the, the really incredible variety of projects that are being funded through the VLS. But with that, I will go on to just note a few uh, of the interesting projects. So first, for example, the project being spearheaded by Seneca College, which focuses on a new approach to assessment that goes beyond the traditional proctored exam, including grading and feedback. This project is geared towards both online and hybrid learning. So that continuum, and it gives instructors the ability to incorporate authentic and alternative digital assessment strategies into their teaching. So check it out in the showcase for more information. Also, another pioneering project to flag is Queen's University Canad Art Histories. And this is an open educational resource on Indigenous and Canadian art and visual culture. This is a contributor-based course with customizable resources that challenge traditional narratives of Canadian art history, which have excluded Indigenous and diverse works. It aims to broaden the definition of Canadian art in relation to decolonization, equity, and inclusion. So that incredible ability of the virtual learning strategy projects to, to uh, champion and drive the incredibly important priorities around inclusion, uh, reconciliation, uh, diversity. And then uh, there's the University of Toronto project that explores various uh, online course design frameworks and shows how adapting technology can increase engagement and well-being among students. Uh, and one of the sessions that I caught yesterday was the digital wellness session and just what a valuable session um, and highlighting that incredibly important uh, priority of well-being, digital wellness, and uh, really appreciate the conference's uh, focus on that topic. And one last initiative I'll share uh, from the nearly, as I said, 400 projects, check them out, is the virtual reality asynchronous learning experience led by Six Nations Polytechnic Institute. This project is going to deliver a virtual reality resource which will support the intergenerational transfer of Indigenous knowledge and languages while strengthening Indigenous technological capacity. Incredible. And that's just a selection of projects from the first round of VLS funding. And the good news is, as you know, there will be more to come. 
Um, so earlier this month, thank you again, eCampus uh, launched a second call for proposals for virtual learning projects. And I'm sure that these projects will build on this year's uh, successes. So thank you to eCampus for your leadership on round two. And to all of you, I encourage uh, all colleges, universities, Indigenous institutes to review eCampus's website where you can find more information about the EOIs as well as submit proposals. And believe me, the deputy, uh, I, uh, Anna, and all of her team at the ministry, we look forward to seeing more of the incredible ideas that will be proposed through this process. So I will just end uh, these remarks. I know we're all very keen to move on to the keynote speaker, uh, but I'll end with what is always a feature of conversations today, of course, a nod to COVID uh, and the impact that it has had on virtual learning. But more importantly, the impact that it has had on the response that you all rallied. Um, the disruption, thanks to the COVID uh, pandemic, provided a really rare opportunity for Ontario and for all of you in the PSE sector to lead the way in demonstrating that our post-secondary education system can be nimble, responsive, and tailored to meeting learners' evolving needs. I'm really pleased um, that the government's virtual learning strategy could be an important part of that response and also show that our collective le leadership and hybrid learning, virtual learning, they are here to stay. So there's much more to do, um, but with ECO's leadership, all of your work and Ontario's groundbreaking VLS, I feel confident about our co-creation and the journey ahead. So thank you again for inviting us from the ministry to share remarks, be part of the conference, be part of this journey, and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Tamara. I really appreciate the, the remarks. And on behalf of everybody here, thank you. And I really, um, really liked how you talked about the, you know, the theme of the conference of co-creation and how that really has, has um, I guess, been the hallmark of how we have worked together. We've worked with uh, Contact North as well, and we've worked with everybody in the sector. Uh, I actually had a phone call with uh, Maxime Jean-Louis uh, earlier today about some uh, collaborations that we're doing. And uh, we're, uh, you know, obviously a huge supporter of what they're doing at, at Contact North. It's such a, that is like truly an essential service, providing actual access points for educate in to remote and rural uh, communities is, is just amazing. And they're such a great uh, partner for us and for you. And I think the, as you pointed out, putting the, um, you know, the, the idea that we're all working in this together is uh, I think one of the, one of the best parts about, well, certainly it's the best part about my job. Uh, getting to you know work with folks like you and Anna and everybody there, as well as uh, Maxime and his team, as we help the province support like the government's virtual learning strategy. Uh, so I, I want to say thank you very much for that, and thanks for coming uh, to give us some remarks. And uh, one thing I'll point out is the uh, feed loop site that we use for the conference has I think about a dozen of the uh, VLS one projects highlighted. And I'll just put a link in the chat where you can find the full list of projects for the nearly 400 that have uh, that have come through. It, it is pretty amazing to see the uh, diversity of, uh, of projects that have come through and also the collaborations and how people from different institutions from across our indigenous institutes, colleges and universities are collaborating to co-create the future of virtual learning together. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, just uh, pivot over to introducing our keynote speaker um, and just comment briefly that moving to a fully virtual uh, teaching style definitely brought up the question of how we build communities outside and inside the classroom. How do we create brave spaces where everyone feels like they can voice their concerns and where everyone feels like they belong? And what can each one of us do to promote inclusion and anti-racism? So today's conference topic, as I said earlier, is about community belonging, inclusion and anti-racism. And I'm really pleased to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Andrew Campbell. So Dr. Andrew B. Campbell, or otherwise known as Dr. ABC, is a graduate of the University of Toronto with a PhD in educational leadership, policy and diversity. He is presently an adjunct faculty member in the Master of Teaching program at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at University of Toronto and an adjunct assistant professor at Queen's University in the Professional Master of Education program. 
He is an Ontario certified teacher and has been an educator for over 25 years in Jamaica, the Bahamas, and Canada. He has authored two books, Teachable Moments with Dr. ABC, A Spoonful for the Journey in 2015, and The Invisible Student in the Jamaican Classroom in 2018. His research and teaching focus on issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, racism and anti-Black racism, educational leadership, Black LGBTQI plus issues, and teacher performance evaluation. He has presented at numerous peer-reviewed academic conferences and has delivered many presentations as a workshop facilitator, keynote, and motivational speaker. He loves people, food, fashion, and traveling. And having had the good fortune to spend a bit of time with him prior to this, as, as we got to know a little bit about each other, I think that you're going to find him very motivational. So, Andrew, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Robert. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, good afternoon. And it's good to be among, in a space like this, listening to all the amazing projects and stuff I heard about assessment and evaluation. I thought I taught the course in assessment and evaluation for Durham College for almost 11 years. So I'm right at home in this space, understanding some of these amazing work. I've been teaching online for years myself, and I've also done studies online myself as a student. And so thank you so much for, for having me as your keynote today. And I do not take this conversation lightly. There's so many times that the deputy minister shared projects and technology and creativity and innovation. And then you would hear the word colonization. You would hear the word indig indigenous. And so it's, it's, it's so powerful that those, those important aspects are still at the forefront of what we are doing. Because oftentimes we do the technology, the innovation and the creativity. And what happens, the reality is that what happens is that some community some community, someone, some group, some identity is left behind, excluded or erased from the process. And so I love your, your theme, your focus today is on community belonging, inclusion and anti-racism. And your theme is co-creating the future. And when I saw the word co-create, the first thing came to my mind, co, it says we're coming together. It's not me alone, it's not you alone, it's an inclusion. But so many times in the core of something, the inclusion, the co-creating, people complain that I was not consulted. I didn't feel a sense of belonging. I was left behind. The people on the committee, there was racism, there was homophobia, there was transphobia, there was um, 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 issues of, of anti indigeneity these conversations are popular and they are every day happening in our campuses. And so we want to make sure that when we are doing these great projects that we understand that projects by themselves are nothing without the people driving the projects. And so my job today is to, con is to have that conversation with us, with all the technology we are doing, all the hybrid and the online and the amazing stuff. And I smile because I've taught online for years. So I understand I'm, I'm in the right place at the right time. I love this. I've taught online for 12 years, unbroken, three semesters a year for 12 years. So I know this stuff and I understand this stuff and I'm excited about this stuff. But one thing I also understand is the issues that happen within online learning face-to-face -face learning, hybrid learning, when it comes to community, belonging, exclusion, inclusion, racism, anti-Black racism, LGBTQ issues, all of these issues of inequities and our, our, our equity, they also happen in the online classroom. And so before we move into the future, thriving, which is important, we must have a discussion, an honest discussion about the truths when we think about equity. So a few questions I want you to consider as you thought about equity and, and the work you're doing and the work you have been doing. What are those issues of inequities we saw during the pandemic? Who were the persons among us who were marginalized and disenfranchised during the pandemic? I remember when the pandemic hit and everybody said, oh, go home and go from your home office. This is my home office. 
But I want to explain to us that this is not what is regular everybody has. But there was a tone out there when you say go home that people felt like everybody had access to an home office. Everybody had access to technology. Everybody had access to their own, their own, their own iPad or, 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 or Chromebook or something. And then we start to realize that not everyone had the same access opportunity. We started to see communities that have, have been disenfranchised for years, further disenfranchised. What were some of the realities of equity, diversity, and inclusion that were revealed during the pandemic? How was the imbalance of power and access further perpetuated during the pandemic? We're planning for our future. So we have to learn from our present and our past. What were the issues of diversity, equity, community, belonging, access, anti-racism, and difference that were exposed during the pandemic? What lessons have you learned and what change is needed? Of course, we can thrive, but before we do that, we must begin with the honest realities of inequities. We have to be honest about colonization. I hear a lot of word about decolonization and we cannot have a decolonization conversation without having one about colonization. We have to be honest about impacts of treaties. We say land acknowledgement at every single event. We have to be honest about what land means politically and financially, how people have been disenfranchised with land. We can't have conversations about anti-racism without talking about racism, the history of racism in our country, the history of slavery. Honest about the ways in which colleges and universities were created for white people and access denied for any other that was different. We have to be honest about policies right now, not yesterday, but right now, pol policies and practices in the back offices of our institutions that still disenfranchise certain people. I'm gonna repeat that for emphasis. We have to be honest about present 2021, November the 16th, policies and practices and, 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 and protocols that we have in our institutions. That's what we call about systematic oppression that still disenfranchise certain people. I teach in the Masters of Teaching program at OISE. And we are working right now intentionally about how we are creating space for racialized bodies, especially black students to be a part of the MT program. We see what happened at University of Toronto in the School of Medicine. We see the apology from Queen University. We see other spaces where racialized bodies, indigenous bodies, racialized bodies have been disenfranchised deliberately. So in our planning, in our innovation, in our creativity, I hope we are giving thought to how we are co-creating the future and making sure we are not making the same mistakes we have made. We have made, and I'm using that term, we have made, because we are benefit, we work in these institutions and we understand and we should understand how these institutional policies and practices have disenfranchised. We have to be honest about the silence and complicity within many of our institutions when we see issues of discrimination. Every day on the news, I don't, I don't need to give you the bad news. I don't serve the bad news. You know, I don't need to share that with you. You have, your, you have your, 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 your internet. You see what's happening. You see what happened at Halloween. Someone, a teacher, an educator at the TDSB showed up in blackface. We see what happened last year in another board at graduation, someone, in the graduation magazine, change a tribute by a black boy to his grandmother and changing is something deficit, disgusting and racist. And I don't have to name you them. You see in the middle of the pandemic, nooses were popping up all over Toronto on construction sites. We see the incidents in the parks 
by people telling people, go back where you come from. Many of our colleges are filled with immigrant students. I know Jamaicans who are dying to go to George Brown and the Humbers and the universities and all they dream of. And let me send to myself, I dreamt of coming to Canada to go to university. I started my PhD. And when I got, and I did two courses at the University of the West Indies. And when I got you to come to Canada, I started my PhD over because part of my dream was to attend a Canada university. I did say the word dream. So when we talk about projects and technology and creativity, creativity and innovation, what we have to remember in all of that, the most, the single most important factor is our students. Who are our students? They form our community. Do our students feel a sense of belonging in your institution? Are your projects and your policies and your practices created in a way that all our students will feel a sense of belonging? You know, right now we see everyone on the equity bandwagon. Everybody's on it and it is right. You should be on it, so welcome. And if you're not on it, you should be on it. You know, it's popular, it's trendy, it's trending. Everyone wants to write an article, a chapter in a book, a journal. Everybody, so many people want to cash in in inequity, in equity. I see people who are even racist doing equity work. People have been exposing people who are benefiting from saying they are First Nations when they are not. We see that happening out there. And, and they do it only because they realize there is a benefit from me walking in this identity. But yet still so many other First Nation people, thousands have been disenfranchised. And someone who is white decide I'm going to use access and opportunity and create another identity so I can benefit. And I say these honest truths to you because I want you to understand that this is urgent and this is serious. And if you're feeling any way of discomfort or any way of, oh, he brought me bad news today, I want you to sit in that and understand the importance of a conversation like this. Many of you are leaders. Leadership is not the easiest role. There's a moral courage that is lacking when it comes to equity, many of our institution, for someone to speak up and to share and to say what is missing, which voice is missing, and how can we fix that? How many of us on September the 30th wore an orange t-shirt? I did. I sure did. I absolutely did that. I changed my background to orange that says, remember the children. Symbolism is important. So don't feel offended by that. Symbolism is important. But my major question would be, what happens after the orange t-shirt? Are we stuck on a land acknowledgement? Are we stuck on black instrument? Are we stuck on a feather dance, a drum and smoke? Because many of us, that's what we, we have done in many of our institutions. We want to pull out a feather, a dance, a drum, a smoke, when we feel like it's time to do so. And every other time, these identities are excluded. How are we working to make changes, to build genuine, authentic relationships in our institution? Write that question down. How are we working to build authentic relationships in our institution to ensure safer, not safe, safer spaces that we can create indeed communities, indeed places of belonging, indeed anti-racist and anti-indigenous do those kind of work. So I ask these questions because oftentimes we come to these conferences and we get to the next steps. We are in a hurry to get to the next steps and move on and people have left the issues unaddressed. And again, we get caught up in the performing nature or the performing of equity. We don't want to perform equity. We want to make changes. We want to be intentional about those changes. And in doing so, my call to you for the next couple of minutes 
is a call for champions. And I know some of us, we are different parts of our journey. I know there are people right now listening to me who you have been a champion. You have been a real ally. I know that. There are persons who are just joining the champion's journey, but you are authentic, you are honest, you're genuine, you're sitting in a space of learning, listening, unlearning. But I'm gonna be, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I have been in other spaces where there are educators who have absolutely no intention. They want this equity thing to go. They want this anti-race and this anti-black racism thing to go. They have lack cultural humility. And these are the same ones who are sitting in front or standing in front, online or face-to-face, -face, of racialized students, and they do not see them. So we have to be honest about where we're at. We have to be honest about the space we want to create. Safer spaces, not safe spaces, because you and I do not get to slap the title on a door. This is a safe space because you said it. I know it's cute. I know it's a beautiful room to put cushions in the room, put the word safe on it and just walk away. I get it. I've been a teacher for 25 years. I get it. But that doesn't make it safe until the users say to you, I feel safe. But we can create safer spaces when we start with braver spaces. So I encourage all of us to join this champion's journey and start with being brave. Because why do we need champions? I just tell you. So if somebody asks me, well, Dr. Campbell, why do we need champions? You can call me Dr. ABC. You can call me Andrew. You can even call me sir. They call me sir. Why do we need champions? I just said it. All those issues that we are having, we want to make sure. Because at the end of this, we want to make sure all of us, when we go back to our spaces, we can genuinely give account for the actions we have taken. I want to repeat that. I want to make sure that when we are done in our own personal spaces, we can genuinely give account for the actions we have taken. I went to a, 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 an online conference earlier this year, the Canadian Congress on Indigenous Lives Matter. And the preamble stated that the Canadian Congress on Indigenous Lives Matter is about a thousand people coming together to honor the thousands of children who lost their lives in residential school system while discussing way forward as a nation and strategies to protect the indigenous people and enable social economic development of their communities. I love that preamble. It says we want to honor discussing the realities of the lost lives, not being afraid to call the residential schools murder crime scenes, not be afraid to say crime scenes and not be offended when somebody says the truth because that's a crime scene. And this on the screen here was a part of the preamble and I loved it. Within you is a desire to stand up for social justice, the spirit to fight for what is right, just and honorable. Within you is a quest to protect the downtrodden, the depressed, the oppressed, and discouraged. Within everyone is a desire to recognize a wrong Ooh, and make every effort to make things right. That is what effective leadership is all about. The quest for inclusive diversity and workplace equity nothing more, nothing less. What I saw when I looked at that, I saw two words. I saw you, you, and I saw everyone. And I wanna make sure as a champion, you understand this. Yes, you are a champion, not because you haven't slayed all the dragons of equity and, you know, and conquer all the territories. You are a champion. The moment you start working, the moment you start looking at your curriculum, the moment you start asking yourself, what can I do better? How can I be more inclusive? You have started the champion's journey. I want us to take responsibility. That's why I use the word you. So as we have this conversation today, I want us to realize this is a courageous conversation. We like to talk about courageous conversation. When it comes to the courageous words, people get uncomfortable. And there's a whole set of conversations out there protecting people from their discomfort. I'm gonna be frank with you. I have no intention of protecting any one of us 
from feeling uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, like the great Bob Marley said, I want to disturb my neighbor. I got dressed today to be here as your keynote so I can disturb all of us. Disturb us to realize we cannot be complicit and complacent. We cannot be sitting down in our seats of access and opportunities and disregarding those among us who are marginalized, disenfranchised and excluded. And that is not just our students. That has to do with your colleagues. I have worked in places. I was at a college once and I applied for a job that I was most overqualified for. Someone was chosen who had way less, and I mean way, way less qualification than I had. And the week the person was given the job, the next week they asked me to do a workshop. That happened to me three times. You know I'm good, but I'm not good enough for the job. You give it to your friend and you ask for my labor. We have to stop this foolishness. I am here to call those things out because we keep perpetuating these things and we don't realize we are not doing right. We are destroying. We are destroying. We want to co-create. It's your word. We want to co-create the future. So my job here is to make sure we walk away realizing, hey, hey, we have seen destruction. We want to create. We have seen persons who have said openly, I have been destroyed because in an institution, the professor never looked like me. They didn't even recognize me. All the readings did not include me. Nothing I learned was from an indigenous perspective, a black voice, an other voice, an LGBTQ voice, any kind of voice, a Muslim voice, any kind of voice. We have to evaluate our personal biases and prejudices. We have to do that. It's a personal work. And it's personal. It is personal work. And if I tell you that I can tell you stories upon stories about how I have worked at my own personal biases, Dr. Campbell, you are biases. You are the equity guru guy. Guess what? You don't get to be where I am without growing and without being intentional about the things that are in your life are the things that you have held on to that were not right. You have to sign up for learning. You have to sign up for unlearning. I'm going to repeat that. You have to sign up for learning, but you have to sign up for unlearning. Let me give you a perfect story, example. And you know, I'm a storyteller. For those who don't know, I tell a lot of stories. I came to Canada 2008. I'm an immigrant from Jamaica. I hope you heard my Jamaican accent. I hope you heard it. It's, it's Jamaican. If it sounds like it was a little bit off, it's because of Jamaica mixed with Bahamas because I taught in the Bahamas for eight years. So a little Bahamian jump every time and it sounds a little mixed, but I love it. And when I saw persons downtown Toronto who looked different, I asked, who are those people? And I was informed, those are indigenous people. They are from up north. First of all, First thing was said to me was they are from up north. So the first thing that I learned that indigenous people have no right being in Toronto. That was one of the first thing. Oh, they belong up. Literally, that was the response. So I guess they're come down in Toronto to do what? And then all the negative, which I won't talk about today, start spewing. And I was shocked. Because I am from Jamaica where the indigenous people were murdered and destroyed by the Spaniards, AKA Christopher Columbus. So when I saw that the indigenous people of Canada survived and living, I was like, God, these people are era, they are warriors, they are winners. I saw them as warriors and winners who fought and still are survived today. But that was not the, what the, 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 the story was told to me. The deficit thinking, the bias, the negativity. And I had to unlearn that. I had to invest in my own learning. I took two courses, two courses in First Nation Studies. And no, I didn't do it because I need a promotion. 
And I didn't do it because I needed more money because I was at the top of my scale by then. I didn't need any more course to get my salary. We have to learn to identify the patterns in our, in our space and address them. If we don't address them, then we are wasting our time. We are performing. And we have to learn to develop a personal action plan, school plan, class plan, program plans, department plan, and a personal action plan. Because without that, what we are going to have, without that, what we're going to have is a stage, is a performance. Without that, what we're going to have is a performance. And when we have a performance, what happens is that we come to a conference like this. And because we're engaging a performance, we leave here unchallenged. We leave here unchanged. And as the children say, the younger people, the younger people, because I'm young too, unbothered. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I want to tell you, my job here today is to challenge you, to implore the importance of change, and to make sure you leave here bothered. Bothered don't mean you're destroyed. Bothered means you're moved through empathy, your challenge through the honest conversation that you go back to your space and you say, I want to make sure I do something. And let me just caution everybody. Change doesn't mean one thing. I hear a lot of people saying like they're helpless and they're hopeless. How do I do this anti-Black racism work? How do I do this decolonizing work? How do I do this work in making sure my LGBTQ students are, a twist, LGBTQI students are here, my Muslim students, my students who are, who are of other able and, and students who have other kind of dis, dis, um, abilities and, and various ways how they show up. How do I make sure? And the, the, the chorus that we hear people singing, oh, this equity work is extra. It's not extra. Equity should be at the center of what you do. It doesn't become extra work. Who is on your committee? Who have you selected? Those are the conversations we should be having. Who is around the table? And if you have given a seat at the table, how was that seat given? Have you prepared for my arrival? Because it's one thing in saying we are going to be offering a seat at the table. We're going to give a woman a seat. We're going to give somebody who's transgender a seat. We're going to give somebody who is black and immigrant and Muslim and hijab wearing and turban wearing and a wheelchair and, and all that kind of stuff a seat. But have you prepared the table for that person? I know of examples where people have given a seat at the table and they show up and said, my pronouns are they and them. And people at the table refuse to use their pronoun. <laughs> we call that performance of equity, where the seat was only given because you want a picture on your, on your website to say, we have a black person in a seat. We have a trans woman in a seat. We have an indigenous um, person in the seat. How do we move from that? And I know I can hear somebody asking, Dr. Campbell, they are going to always say that. How do I move from that? I want you to write this down. The opposite of tokenism is consistency. Write that down. That's my quote. It's original from me. The opposite of tokenism is consistency. When you start your first thing, people will look at you like, oh, what is she doing? Token. But you have to continue working. And they will realize you're authentic. They realize you're genuine. They will realize you are for real. Because you are challenging and you're making changes. That is why we know you're for real. So a person who fights and argues for a cause or on behalf of someone else, that's a champion. And when I looked at my dictionary, I use a dictionary, a simple dictionary. And it said to me, a champion, there are other words like advocate and proponent and promoter and supporter, torch bearer, flag bearer, defender, upholder, backer, sponsor, prime mover, pleader for. What are we doing? Why do we need champions in the equity work? We need champions. And I use this example. Many of you have seen this picture before. Many of you have seen it. Because we have seen where we have tried the, multi the multiculturalism approach. We have tried the equality where we says everybody gets the same thing, only to realize that it cannot work 
because one size does not fit all. And our students need different things at different time. Differentiated instruction years ago remind us of, of that. It's not new. Universal design for learning, UDL, remind us of that. Multiple ways of knowing, multiple ways of doing, multiple ways of expression. We have these guys in our universe and our colleges. And equity says, let's give everybody what they need. But then, of course, like everything else, the reality sweeps in. And we see that sometimes what was provided for access sometimes is being used for privilege. I'm going to repeat that. What was intended for access have been used for privilege. The boxes were for access. It's been used by one person to stock up on his privilege. There's so much I could say about this. I, all, the only thing I'll say to you when I teach this as a course, I always say, don't focus on the boxes nor the fence. I want us to focus on how we're going to remove the fence. So think about that as you think about this work in equity, in this work in community, this work in belonging. You ask yourself, how am I planning to remove the fences in my institution? I love this. What if I tell you this picture was a, mat a matter of controversy the other day in a meeting I had? Because someone chided me, listen to me carefully, and to say to me, they didn't like me using that slide in the workshop because the, the men who I was going to speak to, I was going to speak to a room full of white male who were leaders. And I was showing the, the work that I was planning to share. And this came up. And the first thing the, the, the consultant saw, she saw the hammer. And she said, I believe the men, I'm going to go into it right now, the men or the persons in the workshop will be a little bit offended with this slide, Mr. Dr. Campbell, because of the hammer in the hand. And I said to her, the first thing you saw is the hammer. The first thing many people saw is the possibilities. All the good stuff in the back, if we break down the walls and the fences that are dis that are allowing our students not to feel belonging, that are not creating communities, that are disregarding the work that we need to do in equity. And I will tell you the sadness of the story. She was so protective of the white men who were supposed to be in the workshop that we had to cancel the workshop. And I say this, it's my story to tell. These are the brave conversations we need to have. And I was so disappointed. I wasn't surprised, I was shocked because what she chose to do was to protect white fragility. So for many persons who ask about the term white fragility, what does that mean? I'm offended by the term. It simply means, get ready for this, it simply means we are focusing on, we are focusing and centering ourselves over those we serve. She didn't want to focus on the possibilities, on the, on, the, on the breakdown. She was offended that the hammer was in the white man's hand to do the work of disrupting and breaking down the barrier so we can have the possibilities. Because she was concerned that the, these people were leaders and how they would feel being spoken to like that. I said to her, this is your choice, but let it be known that this whole intention, you are protecting fragility. None of us should center, write this down, none of us should center our power and our privilege over the work of equity. And it's not for white people, it's for all of us. None of us should center our power, our privilege over the work that need to be done in equity. Many of you, and I'm gonna say this very, very intentionally, many of you have missed opportunities to be a champion. I wanna pause for dramatic effect on that one. Many of us have missed an opportunity to be a champion. So 
So when you hear me asking you to be a champion, I am not asking you to go break down the walls at your school. I am not asking you to block the street and tie yourself to the gate. I would ask you to turn over the table and slam the door and go into the prison office and shout out racism and call out people. I am telling you, there are many ways to be a champion and many of us have missed those opportunities. You know, one of the first ways to be a champion is to show up authentic and to see people, to see your hijab wearing student, to see your black student. I told a bunch of Liberians the other day, we're talking about black excellence. And I said to a room full of Liberians, I said, black excellence was always there. You just haven't featured it. I said, excellence of indigenous people, indigeneity has always been there. You just haven't featured it. I said, go to your library and look at the 40 pictures you have on the wall. How many of those are featuring indigenous and black and other. One person was honest, she came back to me, she said, Dr. Kemby, you were right. I did an equity audit of my library and you were right. And I said to her, what is your action plan? She smiled. She smiled. White librarian, I use color for a reason because I want a center to show you that the work is being done. She smiled, she said, I've already started Dr. Campbell. And she said a story, which I'm gonna share with you. She said, well, the first thing I noticed was that the creation stories, the indigenous creation stories were listed among fairy tales. The indigenous creation storybooks the ones that honor the land and the, and the animals and the people and honor the communication and the connection and the love we have between the land and the trees and, and, the, and everything. Those were placed as fairy tales among Cinderella, Rapunzel, Jack and the Beanstalk, Tumbelina and Sleeping Beauty. And she said, I removed every single one and created an indigenous shelf. We're talking about belonging. We're talking about community. We're talking about anti-racism. We're talking about inclusion. We're talking about equity. We're talking about seeing our students, seeing the people among us, building relationships. And then she smiled a better smile than the first smile. And I look at her and I smiled back. And she said, and then Dr. Campbell, after I did that, then I realized, wow, what a disgrace. I only have one handful of indigenous books in the entire library. And then I started investing in purchasing books so I can tell and allow indigenous voices to tell their own stories in my library. So if you see a wall being break down and you're offended, what you have missed is the message in the back that says, when we destroy break down, disrupt inequities, the possibilities of belonging and community and inclusion will be revealed. Leaders must be purposeful in their role and use their power and privilege to create and remediate policies and practices rooted in systematic racism and act to make them more equitable and inclusive for all employees. And as I wrap this up, I'm leaving you with a few actions. We already talk about this. Who are you doing this work? Understand yourself. Make sure you center yourself. You know who you are. And when you decide to be an ally, you understand what an ally looks like and the work of an ally. You don't center yourself. You understand that to do the work of equity, you have to also know about your own power and privilege. You have to understand that difference is around us and what makes others different and what makes them special. You have to be open to understanding others. Having this courageous conversation, foster an inclusive culture and climate, using the equity lens in all you do to lead, to lead. So as we do this work, 
I'm going to teach, I'm going to give you a little maths. I'm not a maths teacher, but I love maths. At university, at, at teacher's college, I got the award for the best teacher of maths. I do love maths, but I'm not a maths teacher, but I, I did primary maths. And when you're doing equity maths, I call this equity maths, everybody. We start the formula with identifying. That's the equity maths. We start the formula with identifying. What are the issues around us? What is lacking? What is missing? Whose voice is missing? Look around us. What does the staff look like? This is an institution with 20%, with, with 30% racialized population, but the full-time professors are all looking a certain way. Hello? We're not ready for the honest conversation? How are we identifying the marginalization, the insecurities, the mental health and well being issues we have? How are we identifying those? And when we do that, when we identify them, we have to figure out how to disrupt. And like I said to you, disrupt is not a bad word. There are many ways to disrupt. I love to say this. I said, loving black, I told teachers, school teachers who teach kindergarten. I told a bunch of kindergarten teachers, loving black kids is one of the most powerful ways you can disrupt. I was at a school years ago a lot of racialized kids, 90% white staff. And in a staff meeting, something happened in the school. And in a staff meeting, I told the staff, you have to learn how to compliment little black girls when they come to school with their, with their black extensions and their, 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 their plaits and their, their bantu knots and their shiny bumps and their, their wraps and their head ties. You have to learn to, to compliment little girls that wear their hijabs and they have their hijab pin to the side. You have to say to them, I love your hijab pin. You have to learn. There are many ways to disrupt. Disrupt is not a bad word. It's not about breaking down. Disrupt is about building up as well. You have to learn to dismantle. Somebody has to do the call out so we can call in. I never call out without calling in. I am big on calling you in, but we have to call you out. You have to have these brave conversations. When we do that, we can see change. When we do that, we get to co-create a future where nobody feels chastised because of their sexuality and their identities. Nobody feel excluded. Nobody can say, I do not feel like I belong because we have, we have been intentional about the work. So as you leave this work in your various spaces, I just want to leave it to you as a diversity leader, which is our intention for all of us. All of us is to remember the empathy, the moral courage, the courageous conversation, the work we need to do in policies and standards and plans. And I leave you with my final quote for the day. Your actions to promote inclusion in your organization must be intentional and deliberate. I repeat that. Your actions to promote inclusion Belonging, anti-racism work, equity work, community work must be intentional and deliberate. It's not going to just happen. It's not going to just happen. It has to be intentional and deliberate to create that change. Thank you so much for listening. I see comments in the chat going about. Thank you for engaging. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being a part of the conversation. I know you, you know, we're on the other side. It's fine. I feel your energy. Don't you worry. I felt your energy. I saw it in the chat by some of your comments and I felt the energy because you gave it to me. And thank you for doing that. Thank you for pulling. I literally could feel when some of you pull yourself up to the laptop. I felt it. And I'm not joking. I have been teaching for years. I can sense when people are engaged. I felt when you leaned in.
to the conversation. Thank you, Lena. You did that, Lena. You did that a hundred times. Lean in to the laptop. Imagine if we create spaces in our schools, online, hybrid, face-to-face, -face, that our students will lean in to our learning because they feel a sense of belonging. Good teaching. I leave this final one with you. Good teaching is 40% content. Hello, hello. Good teaching is 40% content, 60% engagement. Our students, our adult students, I'm talking, our adult students need to know they belong, need to know you, they care. When you get the accommodation letters, they need to know that they are not being chastised and disenfranchised and seen as deficit. But you got them. You got their back. You are not disrupted and, 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 and are perturbed by another letter of accommodation. But you are saying, hey, let us work together so you can excel. Thank you so much for listening. I think we have, may have a minute. We have about a couple of minutes for one or two questions. Over to you, Robert. We do, Andrew. Thank you so much. That was uh, amazing, engaging, and truly motivational. Um, you. Your your biography was uh, was true to the letter for sure. Uh, the comments in the chat are uh, are obviously evident to that. We do have some time, about ten minutes or so, for questions. And maybe I'll, I'll just kick off by a couple of observations. I mean, that was truly inspirational. And I really like how you located the need for all of us to yes. do the work of anti-racism. White people like myself can't rely on black people to do all of the work. We have to step up and do that kind of work through, as you said, courageous leadership. And yes. uh, I love the equity math at the end, uh, by the way, that was, <laughs> was pretty good. Um, but also to you know, be wary of the performance of equity and to, you know, to strike that balance. And I wonder, um, like maybe I'll just kind of kick things off to get some questions going to, to really unpack that a little bit because I, yes. if somebody is new to equity work, let's say, yes. and, and here in the post-secondary environment, we're, I think we're quite fortunate because we're quite advanced, generally speaking, in, in society, in terms of the rest of, of society. And how do, how do we get people to you know, get past that performativity into true meaningful engagement? Because it might be daunting for somebody to say, oh, well, I don't know. How do I how do I start? And maybe you could, because I think that you're right about performativity. Yes. I just really yeah. would like to hear yeah. you unpack that a bit. Two things I'll say. I always have my pen beside me, right? <laughs> Two things I'll say. The first one is relationships. That's my number one answer. If I had one answer alone to give, that is it. You have to form relationships. A lot of us, we do not have relationship with others. I said something years ago, years ago, maybe five years ago in a book, in my book. And I talked about my white friends. Listen to me carefully. I said, I have white friends and they know I'm black. I have genuine relationships, not a white friend who has me as a token. Now there's my one black friend, white friends who have been to their house. I've been to their homes. I've been to their cottage. I've been to their weddings. I have been to christening of four different kids and of four different kids, I am the MC at every single person in. I've been around their dining tables, genuine relationships. So watch me carefully, Robert, and everybody else. So if they wanna ask me a question about black or because I identify as gay as well, I'm also part of the LGBTQ community. They don't have any, they don't feel funny asking me. They don't have to be scared of asking me. We have relationships. What we lack with, in many of our work is a lack of relationships. I've said to many schools, let me give you an example. I've said to many schools, when is it that you invite a First Nation person in your school? Everybody has the same answer. It's September the 30th or Orange T-shirt day. One day we invite our First, uh, first sorry, First Nations people inside our school. One day, one day. And on that one day we want fire, and I get very, very emotional and a little bit upset when I say this because every time I say I have not unpacked why it affects me so much, I think I know the reason why because I really, really see it as abuse. We want the indigenous person to come into our school that one day. They, we want a dance, we want a costume, we want fire, we want smoke, we want drum. And I get, as I said to you, I'm, I'm trying to really own myself right now because every time I say this, it bothers me so much. 
And when that event is over, there is no more connection until next year, the same time again. And I've said to chief principals, how can you foster relationships? So I give an example. I said, you have in your reading week, you ask everybody to come and read. You ask a First Nation person to come and read. Read a First Nation story. You have, and they don't need to, need to read because another way of, of, of knowledge is to show our students that not every story is written. So you have the First Nation person come and tell a story because that's a very big part of First Nations community to show them not every good story is written. Some good stories are oral language and they are tradition and they are sacred and they are passed on through traditions. When you have in your big events and you have in persons who are, who are saying the welcome and you have persons who are giving the voter tax and you have persons who are bringing, bringing, in, bringing um, opening remarks, ask your First Nations um, community leader to be a part of that ceremony. Show up in spaces where you don't need a feather, a dance, a drum, and a smoke, relationships. And the next part of the answer is going to be this, symbolism. Now, I, I teach leadership. I'm going to a textbook. There's a textbook here, um, um, Reframing Organizations. Reframing Organization, that textbook. And it talks about the four frames of leadership. And one of the frame, I, I know the business people in the room, it, it, you know, maybe say thumbs up. One of the frame of leadership is symbolism of organization, uh, is symbolism. Symbols are important. The crest you made, you made your own little circle, I, or you talk about that, Robert, you made that. You're, yeah, it's a symbol. You know, we put the flag, it's a symbol. We have certain things that says who we are, it's a symbol. We have our diploma, we have our, 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 um, our seal. The, the flag, these are symbols, they are important, but we have to move beyond the symbolism and the performance, the performance is that we are stuck in symbolism. We are stuck in, let us get all the black people in the building for February. Right now, I, I, I'm not starting getting them as yet, but I can tell you about the 1st of January, my email is filled with opportunity to speak. If I was to make a living, I would be a millionaire in February and I would die for hunger the other 11 months. But, I, but that's not my reality. So amen to that, right? But because so many people want to hear your voice only one time, we have to normalize equity. We have to normalize, I don't need LGBTQ people in the building only in June, it's pride. LGBTQ issues are all through our issues. And so we have to normalize this. And, and let me just put this there as a closing part. All of us, including myself, will always be looked at, accused, suspicious as, well, let me see what he's doing. You have to learn that, as, especially as a white man or a person doing this work, you will always be looked at, and well, as the kids would say, with a side eye. Because we have a history of not trusting people because of the damage. So you can't force indigenous people and, and racialized bodies to trust you because you showed up today at a, prof, at, a, at a conference. When you leave this conference and you start doing the work, intentional work, they're gonna say, aha, look what Robert has done. They have created black indigenous courses. They are now using, like for me in my work, I'm using way more indigenous and black and racialized authors in my courses. Every single course I have, I'm teaching, I am intentional about the reading list. Years ago, that wasn't so, Robert, because I kept doing what I was taught to do. Get a reading list, here are the 20 books, and the 20 books are 20 white men who have written them. Now I am disrupting that. Now I am dismantling that. And so you see it in every way, every shape, every form. A simple thing is you see a committee. Let's say you have a, let's say you have a tech challenge in your university, Robert. It's a tech challenge. And there's going to be 11, it's, um, six people on the committee of the judging panel. You and I know, because I've done this before. It's a true story. You look at the panel and they give you six people that look the same. And the candidates are racialized. And I had to take the, the paper, Robert, and I said, all the judges are white, six people. I said, can we switch it up? And they said, whoa, we never think about that, Dr. Campbell, because 
because you're intentional about it. It's right through even how the judging panel looks like. Why are we still having a panel of six white men? Why are we still having interview panels in our universities with seven people on the interview panel and there are seven white professors and the interviewee is the hijab wearing black woman. We have to disrupt those kind of things intentionally how we move out of performance. Thank you. Well, Andrew, I have to say that's very powerful. And I, I, I really think that you've, you've articulated nicely the work that we all have to do that we're all responsible for. And also the work that we need to do on a daily basis in terms of, of promoting equity and decolonization and diversity and inclusion. And so we are, we're just at time, we had that question come through and you actually answered the question that maybe you saw it out of the corner of your eye, but I just wanna read it because Stevie Please. Jonathan uh, typed it in, said, I cannot tell you how much this made my spirit happy. Um, goes on to say, I have a question and how do we bring our colleagues to the understanding of intersectionality to avoid harm and promote inclusivity of all of the experiences of a person. And yeah. I think you've really, like you've really nicely articulated that in terms of the, the foundational element of relationships. Yes. And to not be afraid to ask the question. Yes. And so I, I guess I'll just close this off because we're, we're at time and it's time for a break. Before um, you close off, 30 seconds. Yes. I want to, I, want to I, you, I answered this question already about relationship, I know. But the first part, I want to honor what he said about how he was feeling. I want us to realize something. There's something I talk about, I talk about hashtag black joy a lot. And it's not just black joy, it's period, it's joy. You have to remember the work of equity. People ask me, oh, I always keep smiling. It's not the bad, dirty work that is muddy and messy. It is, but, the, but imagine when we do this work and it's grounded in hope and healing, there's joy. There is joy in breaking breaking down and seeing the newness. All I saw was joy. I didn't see a hammer. I saw joy. Thank you so much. Thank oh, you. Andrew, that's amazing. Uh, hashtag joy. That's, uh, well, that's going to blow up the Twitter basically right now. Absolutely. Uh, in, in about 10 seconds. Listen, uh, Dr. ABC, uh, on behalf of everybody here at eCampus Ontario and everybody who's attending today, I want to say thank you very, very much for the, the honest, forthright, powerful and inspirational message that you have delivered today. It's uh, been truly a, a pleasure to, to listen to you and to host you here today. Uh, and I look forward to, uh, to continuing to follow your work and, and hashtag joy uh, as we do this work together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Thank you for Amazing. having me. It's a privilege and an honor. Thank you. So we have a break now um, and uh, we will, uh, uh, see you at the next session in about uh, 15 minutes. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you there.